Right, um, welcome everyone. I think we'll start this meeting. Um, so this is the open meeting about the consultation <coughs> on geography and sociology. Um, up behind us we are using the hashtag SOS. and so if you have any comments or questions, we can't actually see them, but feel free to post them up um, for your enjoyment. Um, so we'll begin with a little bit from Tony um, about the consultation. Um, but just to let you know, if you have at any point any comments, criticisms, questions, um, feel free to put your hand up, and um, if it's quite urgent, wave your hand, if it's on the same point. Um, but I think we'll quickly hand over to yourself. Thank you again. Uh, thanks very much for organising this uh, meeting. This is, the, I think, the third in a series of meetings with students. Um, this is part of, I just want to be clear about, if you like, the process here, that this is part of the consultation process, that the proposals went out on the 10th of uh, May. Uh, to the affected areas and, and there is now a consultation process until the 10th of June and as part of that consultation process uh, we're meeting with students in the affected areas and in a sense uh, the purpose of these meetings is to get your views on the proposals, to get your responses and reactions to the proposals as they stand and to take these back into the academic uh, review group which is, if you like, looking at the subsequent processes and deliberations on these proposals as they <coughs> go forward in the university. And there is a Senate meeting on the 22nd of June which will consider any revised proposals, and there is a court meeting on the 28th of June which, if you like, is the final decision-making body. What I want to be clear is that the review group which uh, has devised these proposals and the review group which is, if you like, assessing the consultation as we go through this process is not the decision-making body in this context. The decision-making body is actually Senate and the University Court. And that, in a sense, is, gives you an overview of the kind of formal process here of consultation. I mean, that's as much as I wanted to, to say because my understanding was that the purpose of this meeting was for students to raise questions, to make statements, okay, to um, raise any issues, and that's the way in which they've proceeded in, in the other meeting. So a little bit about my introduction. Sorry, I'm Graham Allen, I'm your Vice President here. Um, if you do have any questions, just stick your hand up. It, it, it might also be worth um, if we all introduced ourselves oh, yes, rather than, okay. because, and I'll let Mark. Right, I'm Mark Post, I'm head of the law school, I'm a member of the faculty management team and I've been involved in making and developing these proposals. Sorry, I'm Lorna Dugla, I'm the faculty manager and I'm also a member of the FMT. I'm Lisa Wolfson, I'm head of School of Psychological Sciences and Health and I'm also a member of the faculty management team who's been involved in developing these proposals. I'm Nigel Fab, I'm the Vice Dean for Research in the Faculty and I'm also a member of the faculty management team. Okay, so we open it up to the floor, um, any questions or comments? Yep, yes, sir. So why is the faculty ma management team not thank the department for what you want? What are the reasons? I think, have you seen the proposals? I don't know whether anybody's yeah, seen, seen the proposals. I think broadly the issues for the faculty uh, as we, if you like, develop the next phase of the integration of the faculty uh, is in a sense how we invest in our strengths. And I think that that is under constraints, under the constraints of student numbers and under the constraint, under financial constraints as well. And I think in relation particularly to geography and sociology, they're slightly different. I think if you look at the proposals, the proposal is that we withdraw from geography, but when we looked at sociology, the proposal is we're re we want to reconfigure sociology. So I think there's slightly different, if you like, proposals here. The rationales relate to, if you like, research trajectory, uh, they relate to financial context, and also to academic sustainability of these areas, which are relatively small, and the amount of investment which would need to go into these areas to bring them up to, if you like, the research standards which the university expects would be quite significant. So I think there are issues about sustainability, there are issues about research, and there are issues about uh, finance too. And I think it's those sets of issues, rather than, if you like, one specific element of them, which is part of the proposals. And that's nested within, if you like, a broader set of issues in terms of the faculty uh, about sustaining itself financially and also sustaining its academic uh, portfolio. It might be naive of me to say, but if this department's got one of the highest student-to-teacher ratios, when most of them aren't even paid to do research, 
Isn't that one of the most sustainable departments in terms of money that comes in per student? But, but we're also looking, if you like, it also it's, it's research sustainability and whether, in a, in a sense, there's critical mass to retain both research output but also the quality of research output which the university, if you like, seeks to aspire to. Because that's, I think, central to the future of the university and also to the, to the faculty. And it's something that we're asking all areas in the faculty uh, to, to, to kind of reflect upon. Uh, but also to aspire to. So it's not specifically, if you like, targeted at geography and sociology. The general aspirations about research uh, relate to the whole faculty. And indeed, in other areas of the faculty, uh, where there are high staff student ratios, equally there's very good research performance. So we want both. Two points related to that. One is the staff in the sociology and geography department aren't paid to do research. They're on much lower wages to pay for be teaching staff. And in 2008, there was a review that said, recommended that if the department brought on more research staff, then they could meet these goals. And that was just, that was never provided for the department. So it seems, it's hard to see that it's not a foregone conclusion that they said, we need these staff, and then they've not been provided, and then, well, of course, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You seem to identify the lack of resource to meet the needs of the goals that you put in place, then decided to deliberately, potentially cynically, keep them underfunded. And it's still managed to achieve comparable research to other departments that are not up to get the goals. So I think, you know, you're an answer to your own measurements to some extent. I don't think they were underfunded. I think that, that they were provided with, if you like, part-time staffing. They were provided, they were, uh, were provided with contract staffing. Uh, to deal with the teaching. Uh, equally, there are, there are four members of, core four members of staff uh, on academic contracts, and actually two additional members of staff joined them uh, when the school was actually formed. So I, I think that, in a sense, it's probably not entirely accurate to portray it as, as the way you have done. It's also fair to say that the investment which you mentioned was actually made conditional on the school or the department as it then was performing well in the RE 2008, which sadly it didn't do. So the, the investment that you're talking about, which came out of the excellence review, in, in fact, was predicated on a, a good RE result, which wasn't unfortunately forthcoming. Could I just ask what the RE is? Just as oh, sure. Sorry, the research sure. assessment sure. exercise. Yeah. That's the kind of government driver for research quality what, yeah. metrics are the, what, what does it measure? It measures outputs, the research environment, and the esteem of, of in which members of the, the department concern are held. <coughs> and the RE 2008, I think it was 75%, was on the quality of outputs, yeah. publications, research reports, books. So. And you don't see a, like an ironic correlation between the, <coughs> the number of staff in a department, the ratio of staff to students, and the output? But I, I think that this was actually the 2007 review. Was, yes. was, was the investment was predicated, I think, as Mark has said, upon on, upon performance in RE 2008, which which actually showed very little improvement on 2001, even though the staff had actually changed considerably in that time, 100% change in, in staff. Okay, good. Take it go. But the uh, RE result is very comparable to other departments that at the moment, although I'm sure they're probably wondering what's going to happen to their faculty if they're from the social sciences anyway, uh, very little difference. Uh, European studies was 190, that was less than sociology at 1.95. Uh, international studies was two. Very little difference in terms of, if, if, if you're basing the whole decision making process on that RAE, to me it doesn't take an awful lot to unpick those figures. And I think what you know, I speak on behalf of everybody here today, we don't feel we're getting the true picture in exactly what's happening to sociology. Uh, I can only speak for sociology, but I believe geography is in a similar boat. Um, it seems to me that you are just simply wanting to wind down the department, and there has been strategies in place to make sure that the department cannot, cannot function, cannot perform to your level, so that it then turns into uh, a lost cause. No one's taking sociology, that nobody wants to study that particular um, discipline, and there you've got your, your argument all wrapped up. That doesn't, it's just not backed up. I don't feel, and we don't feel, from the, the, the consultation papers that we've got in front of us, the figures are just not adding up. So we would prefer it if, it if there is an ideological reason for why you're getting rid of the social sciences, that we, we know that. 
before we start making our career choices based on that, on that, on, you know, on that future. It just doesn't seem to add up to us at all. I think that there is, there's no ideological agenda here, and there's no, yeah. there's no other agenda. <laughs> here. The, the the figures that the figures that you quote actually are not comparable. Uh, the what the academic development group did is it looked at all those areas in the faculty, which had come in quartile four. That's the bottom quartile of the research assessment exercise. Uh, you can't compare the. You've used what's called the, the grade point average figures in there. Yeah. You can't compare them across disciplines because in each discipline the average grade point is is actually very very different. So in some, if you take economics for example. The grade point average in economics is three point something. In fact, it's very close to four. In the the lowest uh, grade point average, which is in I think nursing and allied professions, is about one point nine five. So actually, the only way you can compare research performance is, is in terms of what's called research quality and power. In other words, the quartile, the ranking, if you like, that other sociologists gave to sociology, and it, it wasn't the university. And we have to be clear here, uh, it was other sociologists who ranked sociology and geography in the bottom quartile, not the university. But how do you expect sociology and geography at Strathclyde to be able to perform if it's working, if, if, if it's the staff levels are at the levels that they are? And, and strategically, because I've been here now for five years, there were strategic <coughs> things in place the last two years to, to combine sociology and, and, and geography and change the staffing all around. and. We were in the yeah, second year at that point, and that was a complete lovely nightmare, by the way, for those of us that were trying to struggle then to actually get a degree, shafted, and you're going to do the same thing to the, the, the poor people coming through first and second and third year again. It's, it's not fair. I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of the other Do you mean the change, the integration the of the faculty? The changes from, from two years ago, yeah, that didn't work. That then meant that the staff levels were kept at an absolute... Um, a very shallow level, which then the research wasn't being done, and that's why it's... It looks like that's why sociology and geography isn't performing because it's not generating enough research income, and that's fair enough. That's a concern. How on earth are 4.2 or whatever percent of staff supposed to do it? And they've got 100, 100 students each to try and get a degree at the end of it. But I think if you like, if you look at the staff student ratio, it actually varies because if you look in, if you look in, say, say sociology, and you look at first year and second year, mm -hmm. there's a large number of students, yeah, and then actually it declines quite markedly by 60, 70 percent in terms of actual honours, so you have to look overall at what the ratio is. So what, would it not, not be sensible to perhaps look at why sociology and geography students aren't taking it to third and fourth year? Could it be because when we joined here and went £20,000 in debt, there were 15, 16 modules to choose from, and by the time we got to third year there were six? But those, those changes came from within sociology and geography, is my understanding that the changes within curriculum were actually driven by some of that need to, to rationalise, which actually was across the whole faculty, not, not simply in those areas. Just, you say it's not, there's no ideological background to these proposals at all, but we, we get, keep getting told time and again that there's this sort of narrow vision of the university as a technological university, as a business university, as a law university, or, or however it wants to be packaged up. What I don't understand is, is how you can sit there and barefaced say that there is no ideological background to this, when that is quite clearly being pushed to us, that this is uh, to do with a narrow vision of the university. I don't think it is a narrow vision uh, of the university. The university has made clear uh, that PATS, the humanities and social sciences, are absolutely central to the vision of the university and its future trajectory. The university is investing and has invested both last year and uh, just this week, invested in new posts in, in HATS, across HATS. So I don't really accept the view that this is a very kind of restricted vision, and indeed, even if you take these proposals into account, we will still have, if you like, a breadth of subject choice. With the new curriculum, we'll probably even have more choice within that. And so that I'm not quite sure what you mean by ideological in this sense. So, you know, as a, some kind of restrictive agenda connected to business or whatever. If you look at social work, uh, if you look at law, for example, has a law clinic, it's heavily engaged in the community and, and so on. So. It's, it's not an ideological crusade which is restricting or redefining the humanities and social sciences. I think far from that. I think it's actually repositioning the humanities and social sciences. It's rhetoric, it's, though, isn't it? Surely, like... Well, it depends. Again, it depends what you mean by... Decimating by, is by, another word for repositioning, if that's what you want to do. 
Well, it's it's reconfiguring, it's re it's repositioning. That's an accurate that's an accurate phrase. I don't see it as ideological in that sense. Uh, regret I haven't actually seen a consultation document, so you might be able to educate me on the way through. Um, I'm a part-timer, I'm in second year. Um, I hope to finish second year in my third year, I know, which is next year. But um, I, what is the timetable for withdrawing from geography? And depending upon that, how actually can you provide me uh, with let's say four, at least probably four years still to go, uh, with the uh, prospect of uh, good quality lecturers to uh, take me through to a degree standard. Well, in a sense, there is no time because these these are actually proposals. If well, assuming if that, so the proposals if the, were accepted. Well, if the proposals were accepted exactly as they are in their current form, yes. then the plan would be for the program to run out over, if you like, the period of which both continue, if you like, part-time students and full-time students would complete. So uh, the commitment is to ensure that all students complete on whatever program they have registered for, uh, and the commitment is to ensuring that the educational provision and the educational experience will be sustained in terms of its high quality. So, and we'll do that because we'll put in place transition arrangements, we'll put in a transition team, which along with staff in those areas, and those staff are very professional, as you know, they're very committed and so on, to ensure that our commitment to, to students is actually fulfilled. And I think this has been done in other parts of the university, where there have, there's been kind of reshaping, refocusing, or whatever, in the business school and so on. So there is experience around that. It's done in, in other universities as a natural course of events of changing, adapting the curriculum and so on. But that's our commitment. That's our commitment, and we will ensure that commitment is fulfilled. Do you want to respond? Yeah. Uh, just, um, as you can see, I'm not in my first flush of view. Probably older than any of you sitting at the table there. Um, and I've had experience as well of uh, 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 working in businesses that have really figured. Um, my experience of that has been that uh, once there has been a decision to make a major change, um, what you suddenly find then is that all the people that have got let's say, a high standard of uh, ability, are going to vote with their feet. How are you going to stop that from happening? I, I don't understand how you can provide, <coughs> let's say, an economist to provide me with, uh, with, with the, the geography expertise, or however you deal with the transitional issues. I mean, that's something we'd have to look at in terms of the specifics of the staffing. And I think there are, there, there are if you like, ways to ensure that, that staff are kept for throughout the period and so on through incentives and various other mechanisms. So I, I think we'd have to look at that. It would also, it also involve discussions with individual staff. We'd also have to look at support from the wider faculty and the wider university. Are you having those discussions with staff? Well, what would they have with the code? No, because, we, because these are proposals. These are proposals. We cannot have those discussions. When do you plan to have these conversations with staff, if, to maintain consistency if, if if the proposals were accepted as they stand, yeah. then we would immediately have to consult with staff and students. And yeah. we would actually, th at that point then, we'd engage in those deliberations okay. with staff. Could I have the person? Can you maintain your connection to the students after you say about that email or the medical exam? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hang your heads in shame. This is a man academic exam. institution and your moral obligation, first and foremost, management and business head or not, is to the students within this institution and our welfare and our education. And I'm disgusted by everybody that was involved in that decision. You should hang your heads in shame. I'd like to hear you. I think you should explain yourself. Why, why write your medical exams? Because once the once the decision was taken on the proposals, we had to actually consult with staff. It's a legal requirement. You cannot you cannot in that situation you cannot leave a period of time because there are legal requirements on the university to consult with staff whenever it's actually considering either withdrawal from a, an area 
or where there could be potential redundancies. So in a sense, the, the dilemma was uh, for, for the faculty in the university, we have to consult with staff. And if we have to consult with staff, then that means we have to tell students at the same time. There's no, there's no legal way around that. There was no coincidence over your time scale, but your consultation and your proposals. There was absolutely no coincidence there. You deliberately planned your proposal at the same time knowing that your consultation with right. staff was going to occur during the exam periods. No, that's, that's absolutely you know, not the case. It's, it's not the case. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's simply not, not the case. It's not the way the deliberations on ABG didn't even consider that. No, I say it didn't consider. It didn't consider. I think the issue as you portrayed it, we consider, we substantively looked and reviewed at the, the areas. But what you've been asked is shouldn't you have considered it? Considered what, sorry? That you were bringing out this proposal during the middle, right in the middle of our exam period. If I say, once, it have been. once we had got into deliberations and reviewing these subject areas, we have a legal responsibility once we got to the stage of the proposal that we had to consult with staff. The business before you. No, it's a legal requirement. It's not a business requirement. Yeah, it's, it's actually a legal requirement. Okay, so legality to have it when you've had it. Your proposal, this is the point you're not answering me, and this is what everybody's getting at. When you decided to go ahead with these discussions on your proposal, that was done at a specific time within the calendar. Yeah. You knew those proposals were going to come to the forefront at the time of exams. You knew that when you when you went into it consultation yourself about it. Yes, but because as I said, we had to consult Delivery. once we had the proposal. No, yeah. you're 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 talking about at a later stage in the process. What's being asked of you is why the proposal was put forward at that point in time. We know that it's a legal requirement for you to consult once the proposal is put forward. But the proposal was put forward at a very particular time in the academic calendar, and that is the question which is being asked of you. Because everybody knows, now that you've said it four or five times, yeah. that you must consult legally. Yeah. What is being asked is why the proposal came to fruition at that exam period, because from where we're sitting, it looks very cynical. So it would be quite good for yourselves and for your own public image if you could clear that up for us. But it, it, I, this, if you like it, I can understand it appearing cynical, but there was, in fact, there was no conspiracy behind that in terms of it being cynical. I think the issue had to do with the deliberations on ADG, and that ADG had to do its work, and it had to do its work in a rigorous and substantive manner, and that took time. And one of the consequences of Can you understand from our perspective it shows a bit of lack of awareness? No, I, no, I, I, understand, from your, I understand from your perspective how it can be constructed. Yes, I certainly understand yeah. that. But what I'm trying to say is it has to do with due process and ensuring that that due process took place. Because clearly, uh, nobody dealing with these very serious issues which affect staff and students, you wouldn't have wanted a process either which was completely condensed and collapsed where there wasn't sufficient, if you like, scrutiny of the issues. And that's what we had, we had to deal In with. In that case, then, why did you give staff 24 hours notice to attend a meeting? There was no, there was no lengthy consideration there before you actually consulted staff. So it was rushed through. Of course, it was rushed through. If you were being considered two staff and two students, they would have had at least, in my opinion, and I think speak for everybody, at least a week, a week's notice before walking into that consultation room and being told that their careers are on the line and the future of their students is on the line. You rushed that through within 24 hours. No, we, actually, we didn't rush it through within 24 hours. The email to staff went out actually on the Friday, and the meeting was actually on the Tuesday. And the reason that we did that was because uh, the, the advice of HR and the concerns of trade unions that they didn't want, if you like, staff. If there's, a, if there's too big a gap between them when they get that notice and the anxiety that that creates, a week is too long. In that, in that context, and that actually there needs to be a shorter space of time. That was the advice that we got. Okay, could we have the girl in the back? Oh, you fine. Yeah. Um, so could I have Ian, Philip, then yourself? I was just wondering, why is the consultation process, we don't like it, why is it only four weeks long, whereas it could be a lot longer than that? Four weeks long, A, in the exam time, so students can't really concentrate, and B, when it, when it's not, even when it's not an exam time, when students are going home, so you can't even concentrate. So 
A, why do you pick it in this particular time? And B, why is it only four weeks long? Why can't it be longer than this like, to have a proper consultation process? It, it's actually four and a half weeks long. It's actually four and a half weeks long. <laughs> yes. and, and actually, that, that, is, that, is, that is actually longer than any of the other consultation processes. So we should feel privileged to say this is the university consultation period, so, and that period is actually been extended uh, to the 17th of June. Okay, can we have the person agreeing that It seems fairly unanimous that none of us are happy with what's happening here. Sure. But as far yeah. as this is a consultation, how are our opinions being taken on board? And if so, if they are being yeah. taken on board, if we don't know what's going to happen with the staff and once whatever decision is made, Say it's going to be made on an ad hoc basis. We're going to figure out best how you're going to work out the staff and if the department is going to shut down. <coughs> we can't really make a decision properly and what we think about that. If well, it's going to be people brought in from outside, essentially, mm -hmm. you need to do your course. Yeah, but, we, but let's be clear what we're consulting on here is the proposals as they stand. No so it's actually it's actually your view, and I think the student, my understanding is the student union is going to put in yeah. a form to reply to it. A formal response. We've asked for formal responses, written responses. We've asked for responses in, in other formats. We've had email responses. We've had letters. We've had other contributions and so on. That's completely open to students. We've asked for individual contributions and individual responses. And the ADG will take those responses into account. There are a number of issues which have come up in the student meetings which have already gone back into the AG de ADG deliberations, the review group deliberations, which is meeting weekly now, to consider these. And that's the purpose of, of this meeting. Uh, and my understanding is that this is, this is being filmed, it's, it's on the web. So we can use that as, a, as, as, if you like, a resource and an input into the review process. But we want your responses. It's also fair to say that some of the consultation exercises which have taken place around and the Ram's Horn and the Collins Gallery have actually produced interesting alternative proposals which actually are being taken forward. So it's not as though these consultations are empty exercises. We are listening to what you're saying. And if you know, there are proposals that come forward and points that we need to address, that, you know, we will do that. Okay, would you like to reply and then we'll move on to this one? Well, first, I think it's hard for us to really come to this one from we don't know what's going to happen and the department, if the proposals get put through, it's hard for us to say what we want and to know what the choices to make, what education is going to be like after our next year. But secondly, um, <laughs> so the proposals um, state quite clearly that um, the university, the departments that are under threat are offered at other uh, institutions and therefore you wouldn't be uh, threatening uh, those courses in the west of Scotland and you wouldn't be um, closing them off to, to students from the west of Scotland. But something that came up and has come up time and time again yeah. is that Strathclyde has, takes in a very particular demographic. Strathclyde has and always ha it is and always has been sorry, a, a much more inclusive university. <coughs> what is worrying um, outside of our own interests uh, and our own courses is what uh, the, this proposal has, uh, what the, the potential for this proposal to close off sociology, geography, community education and music to, to working class young people, and not just young people, you know, mature students uh, as well, in, in the west of Scotland um, particularly. Um, I mean, what, what's your response to that? Because you can't, you can't look at me and say that it's not fair to say that the RAE uh, results for, for these two quartiles are, are comparable because you can't say that Strathclyde and Glasgow are comparable. I think, I think the access issue uh, which has come up in, in a lot of discussions and something that we focused on in AGG is, is a really significant one and it's something that we're going to have to take back into those uh, deliberations, it's something that we're taking out of these consultation exercises and we're going to have to reflect upon that and the university is going to have to reflect upon it in terms of what it prioritises. So I, I think I don't have any disagreement with you on the issue about access and the issue about the particular role that Strathclyde has in the, in the west of Scotland. I think those then have to be weighed in the context of all the other factors uh, and we have to then, in a sense, assess that in that context. 
So, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it's actually been quite interesting that that's one, if you like, consistent issue that's come up from the student communications and with staff. This is already having an effect on the schools, though, because I've already been in contact with a lot of high schools. <coughs> and now, instead, because we are the only university that supply a course in human geography, kids at school have been forced to go to Stirling, which is an environmental geography. It's not human geography. Kids are already being told by the schools not to apply to this university well, because this course will not be existing. That brings up another Can point. If the hazard has been cut, has it been cut disproportionately across these subjects? And if so, why? Because it seems as if you've already made the decision. The decision has allegedly not been taken, and yet it seems from what we're getting feedback from the school that it's a disproportionate cut on the intake. And I'd like to comment on that. Do you mean disproportionate to disproportionate well, to what? The document says that the different departments will share the pain in terms of the no, reduced I mean, intake. No, because there's no, no, that's no, that's not the case. The, right. the, uh, the cut to student numbers has to do with the fact that. This faculty had a large number of what's called fees only students. Mm -hmm. uh, and because th those students are hi highly regulated by the SFC <coughs> and the university can be fined if you go over a certain percentage uh, of those uh, fees only students, the university last year took the decision that we had to reduce the number of fees only students across the whole university. Because this faculty had a disproportionate number of those fees only students, then we took a larger if you like, hit in terms of the fees only uh, students. But there's no way that that disproportionately affects particular areas because as students come into the BA program, they can, they're choosing, if you like, what, what honours options or combinations they want, want to be. So actually there's no way to, to direct that number or that reduction of fees only students. What it does mean though, and, and this is where it probably connects to the previous question, uh, is that because we've had to reduce the entry on the BA program by something like 45% this year, that it's that that's had an impact on recruitment, not these proposals. These proposals okay, came, came later. The because, the the because, the because the recruitment on those areas means that actually, in a sense, less, student, <laughs> less numbers of students can come to Strathclyde this year to do the BA because there's a reduction in entry. And it's actually quite significant. So you've been waiting um, a long time for this. Like, with the Paris Access, um, like, I turned down that offer at Glasgow and I'm sure lots of other people did because I wanted to go to Strathclyde and now I'm going into my fourth year and I don't know what to say I'm going to get because as it's only a fourth year of maths it counts basically, okay. if certain staff leave, if like, classes that are already limited are reduced, I feel that I could drop down. That's affecting why I'm actually going to come out back at uni. I could get to one instead of a first. I, I don't think so, and I, do, I think, I do, I do. yeah, I can understand, I can understand There's a problem in the hill, believe yeah, no, no, I, no, I, the yeah, student yeah, body is saying staff, you probably don't have classes. much of a tap into it. No, I do have a tap into the it. The same staff can say well, classes uh, aren't running, I genuinely believe, and there's no, there's literally no choices it is. Geography and sociology are already merged. There's only seven classes, seven modules available, which is ridiculous as it is, and now if any of them are cut or certain staff leave, that actually affects what you're going to get in your degree because I've had no not to take a second class because I don't like really get that lecture if that lecturer leaves or somebody from outside comes in that's affecting what we actually get instead of do you know what I mean like but there are maybe two answers to that I mean one that's an issue that the transition team would look very carefully at I mean what options are actually available in honours right. but but it, but in any sorry right. transition team well, we're not even at the point of, of appointing them because the proposals would have to. But then, how can these proposals be properly? Uh, how can we make a decision on this if we don't know who the proposals are? What the time frame is? What's that's happening with staff? That, that, but the it's point. not. They've got to be all of those right? things. Surely, surely that should be part. But, of but the other point. To, the other point to answer you, your your point is that in, in honours, their, their staff will be going on sabbatical. Staff leave anyway. Um, there's no there's talking about generally in university, so you can't necessarily predict whether you'd be able to do a class in honours in any case, in any department, because of the kind of changes. Class list, but, no, that's but, but there'll be no, because there's an entry uh, this year, so that won't be affected in that sense. So I think that the transition team 
will, if the proposals were to go ahead, would deal with all those issues and actually plan those issues out and plan them for the whole cycle. And the reason they can't be in the proposal is because simply for the reason you've already enunciated, which is it would then appear that the that it was not a proposal but a decision. Okay, can we have the boy at the very back of the room? Maybe lots of arguments that I really don't understand, but how do you justify that on a moral basis? Because I don't think there is a moral justification for scrapping courses and I don't, but I don't see how you can justify it for us as students or even justify it to yourselves as educators. I, think, I mean, I just want that actually there are lots of, if you like, difficult ethical choices and the, the review group and the faculty management team team have had to look at those ethical choices. I don't think ethical choices are ever comfortable and I don't think they're ever s simply in one direction. I think that's completely unrealistic. I think what we've had to look at is that we've had to look at, if you like, where the faculty is going, what its strengths are, and what the future of the faculty is in the context of the university. And in a sense, we can have a disagreement about that. But there are ethical choices which underpin that as well, which are about, if you like, the wider faculty and so on. So I think the ethical choices are not never actually simple in these contexts. They're never simple in, in everyday life. And I think if, you know, that's, that's certainly one of the things that I've learned uh, in this position, but also in, in management more generally. An ethical justification for your decisions has been a technical and a, a cost-benefit basis, but I don't see how you've made an ethical, an ethical justification for your decision. Because this is about the strength of the other academic areas in the faculty and enhancing those, and that's, it. that's an ethical choice. It's not a technical choice, it's, it's an ethical it choice. An objective well, I mean, it, and objective structures, and you can't make ethical choices with objective measures, because it doesn't take into account Well, it depends, it depends on measure. partly what you mean by, by ethical. If you take a kind of utilitarian view of ethics, then it, it's, it's ethical because it has utilitarian value. If you take other views of ethics, then it, it's an ethical choice. I don't think you can divorce values yeah, and, and no, decisions. You may no. Let's be clear. You may not agree with the, You may not agree with the values so and the ethics, but these are ethical the choices. Costs or to the good. Does your decision benefit the whole? Does it benefit even the majority? It it benefits the the faculty, yes, and it strengthens and reassures the rest of the faculty because it's about investment in the faculty. Okay. Um, Oh, sorry. No, no. Um, yeah, if you're going to go down the for the greater good uh, response to the bond situation, so those of us that then don't constitute the greater good who've decided to study for the social sciences, it seems to me that we, we've just been left as the, the, the little group that's going to squawk and shout about it for a little while and then hopefully that'll all die down and, and the proposals will go through in the direction that you want it to go in. Um, and I don't think you answered the gentleman's response here even slightly adequately in terms of what staff are going to, what professional staff are going to be available. The staff at sociology, can you speak for those, not geography, because I'm, that's all I know. I've got mortgages, they've got kids to bring up, even without that, they are going to leave. I don't think they can answer it because you haven't got to the point, is what you're saying. Well, we you can't don't, answer you, you, really, you, 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 you can make some bland statements about the transition group will solve all of our problems, and, but it's, it's very, very difficult to see what the transition group can do. If the quality staff are quality staff, the quality staff will not stay once they've been told their jobs are not going to be here. Well, the, the university does have experience of this. I mean, I've gone through two of these with the planning school and the business school and with the hotel school and the, and the business school. And in both cases, there were very strong transition arrangements put in place, which ensured that all students who were on programs were taught out at a high quality. So, I mean, the university has got experience of this, and it has successfully done it before without impacting on sort of student quality. So it is possible. We can't answer it here simply because these are still proposals. So we're not in a position to say you know, what will happen. Would like to respond or? Yeah, because when you made the changes and merged geography and sociology together, you said that the, that, was, that was a fairly smooth transitional period. Many people didn't bother to take their honours year. They just left. 
We're the students that hear what people say. Why aren't you taking it into honours? You need honours. A degree's nothing without an honours. I'm not sticking around. There's six classes to pick from. I'm off. Mm -hmm. That's a disgrace. £20,000 it costs to do a degree. Many of us are from working class backgrounds. Many of us have put this on our mortgage so that we've got a degree at the end of it. For you guys, two weeks before our exams to say, well, two days before our exams, I'm sorry, we don't believe in sociology anymore. You cannot study social sciences without sociology. Sociology is social sciences. You are ripping the guts out of what Strathclyde always, for 100 odd years, always stood for. A, a normal, a straightforward, lucrative education, and you're just, you're ripping it out, and all your argument is, is these are just proposals. You know you've made your decision, you know that we've been sold up the river, and you know that our degrees are going to stand for absolutely nothing, and bugger the £20,000 debt we've all gone into for it. Can I, can I just follow that up by saying that the proposal, I think, um, suggests that like, sociology would be continuing, that it is... I don't want to go to social policy. It's a politics. It's sociology it's is not a politics you, module. But your, your point that sociology is an important subject within social sciences is, is within the proposal, and that's, that's why it's going to continue. That's, well, that's well, well, what about geography, then? Okay, um, go. Thank I yep. basically um, kind of touched on a lot of points, say, talking about access, and my major concern is about young people in the future. Um, looking at some figures discussed at our meeting, there's about 640 first choices for sociology. That's just applicants going into the first year. Then you've got geography, which is I think, over 300. So obviously, ge sociology and geography are very popular social subjects. And then future, you know, these courses will not be available. You know, I don't think, you know, this is a consultation process, these are only proposals, but I don't think you've properly, properly looked at the kind of implications, you know, what about these young people, you know, I'm from a, not a privileged background, but I've managed to graduate just about joint honours and job in history. I just feel as though that, in terms of these proposals, they just, there's no clause there that, you know, talks about the future young people, those that are to study sociology or geography or even community education or applied music. Um, also speaking to my constituency MSP, the Deputy First Minister of the Constitution, privately she believes that these proposals, you know, are just they're not they're wrong. They're just, you know, she always, she thinks that there is another way around them. Obviously, she can't politically, she can't say that because obviously she's a minister. And I think she has written to Professor Jim McDonald, uh, but even she believes, looking at these proposals, looking at the consultation documents, that you know, it's just things don't add up. Okay, and the girl behind the hospital. Yeah, um, if you're talking about the strengths in the faculty, to me, um, I, I don't think the heads uh, in the faculty are a strength because they've let this department down and that's what they're saying. So I, my, if for the consultation process, I would recommend that we get rid of the heads of the faculty first. <laughs> but I see the strengths as being the staff who are completely passionate in teaching all these subjects and it's unfortunate that the corridors of sociology and geography are full of teaching assistants who are employed on short-term contracts constantly. So I still managing to get great results out of Exactly. So the staff are the, the strengths and the, the, the heads who are the, 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 the liability in this faculty. So I propose that they should certainly be let go and the heads to be um, done away with. And this, this fantastic transition team that you keep referring to, this magical transition team, how were they going to come and teach us geography and sociology? Now, I know it's only a proposal, but that's what I want to know. How are they going to come in and teach us human geography at a high standard when you're getting rid of the high standard staff from this university? They're not going to sit about because there was uncertainties. And they can get jobs elsewhere, they will be away. Uh, regardless of your high incentives or your shackles, whatever you're going to do to try and keep them, we're going to lose them and we're going to be left with a very low level of education from this department. So can you tell me more about your transition team that's well, made the coming? As, as we've said, the transition team will deal with those issues and as Mark has said, there's ex experience oh, within the... You're not answering my question, I'm well, sorry. Well, how if, you just let me, if you let me finish. And how will this transition team give the high standard of education? 
because as Mark has said, there's, there's experience within the university of, of managing these transitions, and those transitions have gone successfully in other areas. So there's no reason it's to assume that, they, that it that cannot be the case in these areas. And given that there is a long transition here as well, over four years, there's an entry this year still into these subject areas that reinforces it. How do you feel about it? How do you think they feel now? How do their parents feel? Or if they're mature students and they've said to the husband or the wife, can we afford this? Can we put this on the mortgage, 10 or 15 thousand, invest in me? Or a child coming back, finally got into university. How on earth are they gonna feel, starting here in September, for the next four years of their life, when you've pulled the rug out from under their feet before they've even sat in a lecture hall? How can you justify the prospectus in its current form? It's a product you've sold. I gave up a good career to come back and yeah, do me something too. different. This is my second time at this university. I'm a business graduate from this university, so I'm a previous stakeholder and a current stakeholder. And I gave up a lot to come back. I was sold a product by you in 2009, and I want to know that I will receive that product because I think I've been lied to. Well, you will receive that product. In its current form. In its pure position. In its current form. There's, you can't promise that at all. There's no way you can well, put it down. Well, I can always say thank you. I feel so much better now. Yeah, we'll, we'll make it. We've made that commitment. Okay. Um, just two, two very sort of small questions aside slightly from the specific proposal that, that's been uh, given to us. Um, first of all, uh, how long how long have you been here again? I just want I couldn't remember. Look, a couple of months since October. Right. And what do you what do you what do you feel? Uh, gives you the right to come in uh, within two months as someone who, um, and I can only speak for myself, but I, I know a few other people um, who used to quite respect your work. I say used to. Um, as an esteemed academic, someone who uh, has a has a very prolific work rate, has a lot of work out, and and, and has been, you know, a, a part a, a, for for me certainly a staple of my academic life so far. Um, how can you how can you justify to yourself as much as to us coming in after two months as the hitman and and doing this to us? And what do you stand to gain from it apart from lying in your pockets for perhaps an early retirement? Yeah, Sophie, uh, uh, I've been here since uh, October. If you look at these particular areas, uh, they go back a long time. The issues go back to 2001, the issues go back to 2004. In other words, uh, these issues were already identified. Uh, your name was on the email, Sorry? that's all I know. All I know is your name was on the email which yeah, came I, to me, well, and that's so, what I'm asking you, what yeah, well, you stand, well, not can't, how far back it goes, okay? This is like, you know, you see the Tories and Labour always saying, oh, well, we, we inherited this from the last... You, I want to know what you are well, starting to gain from If you let me speak, I'll tell you. Fine, okay. but I don't, want to, I don't want to hear about well, the past. Do you want, want, to you want me you. to give no. you the answer? Please. Okay. Um, these, the issues in these areas go back a long way. So when I came in, if you look at the MIG report to Senate, it already identified a number of areas, and it already said that these areas needed to be re-looked at. That's not something that was new. It was something that was identified last year and in, and in previous years. And other members of staff who, who are here have that history. So, so this, in a sense, is not something that was new. So it's not something that I created. And as I say, I did not make the judgment on sociology and geography. The community of sociologists in this country made that judgment, not me. Can I just he, so, so, can I make a quick response just before so, we move on? So, so in that sense, it's not, in a sense, the fact that that I have come in and identified these areas. What we've done as a faculty management team is has to, has to look at where is this faculty going? And under the current constraints, where is it going to invest? Where is its strengths going to be in the future? And how does it align with the university? And in that context, these issues were already there. I, I'm aware that this has been going on for a while because as we have been constantly uh, reminded our, our, our staff um, are majority of the on fixed term contracts and that's been the case for quite a while. It looks a lot like uh, a sort of um, orchestrated wind down so that you can cut yeah. off this sort of gangrenous limb, you know, that's that's how it looks to us. Uh, let, let me finish. You're, what, what's, what's coming out from this, to me, uh, is from, from your answer there, is, is okay, you, you've come, you've inherited a situation 
but there's no way that you started this job without knowing the situation you were inheriting. So for that alone, you should be quite ashamed of yourself as an esteemed academic. But ashamed in what sense? In the sense that what you're doing, what you knew you were doing, and, you were you were doing, were, and, and taking this and accepting issues, this yes, post, and accepting this danger, is that you were accepting the job of cutting uh, a, a no. faculty. No. No, well, you can you can call it reconfiguring or redesigning or re whatever it is, the no, rhetoric and jargon. Not using but you were cutting it. You, you used it earlier. It's on the board behind you as a no. direct quote, and it's on that camera. Yeah. No, I used it before. I'm not using it again. What I said was, yes, I knew there were issues. How we dealt with those issues was a separate matter. And the academic development group and the faculty management team had to look at these areas and come up with a decision and come up with these proposals. And actually what we're going through now is a process of consultation on those proposals. And as many colleagues have said, there may be creative solutions to some of these issues, which arise as they did in terms of the arts and culture consultation, which actually, by the way, only went on for two weeks. And out of that consultation came new kinds of proposals for dealing with some of the issues. So in a sense, that this is a genuine consultation. What you've got here is a set of proposals. These are not decisions. How do you feel personally, last, very last brief point, how do you feel personally about the impoverishment of your own discipline? How do you feel about that? Because that's what's which, happening. Which discipline? Of, I mean, of social sciences in general, of, of, of the, the broad area in which you, you've worked. I don't, I don't see it as, I see this as actually strengthening the faculty and strengthening the humanities and strengthening social sciences. Okay. Um, were you? Oh, no, okay. And um, so there's a person up the back. Any of the panel tell me how they've tried to defend geography and sociology or community education or music? Or have you just, have you been part of the process? Where was it? Which one of you stood up and said, no, I don't think this is right? Or is it just, is it a coalescence of all the management team? Or did anyone say, do this, that may make it better? Yeah, anyone looked at the bed? Where, where, who's the person that's... Who's the person that stood there and been critical of these proposals? Because it doesn't look, none of you have sat there and said, we don't agree with this, we don't think it should be done like this. You've all went along with the process, and none of you seem to want to defend it. No, that's not correct. We all support the proposals, but in getting to the stage of the proposals, we discuss them very fully. Everybody around the table did exactly what you said, acted as devil's advocate and put other arguments and tried to think of different ways around it. These are the proposals we've now come to. And what would be very, very helpful is if what happened with the cultural proposals, if people came up with others, this, this was what we thought was the proposal. Better ideas we, would be great. Let, let's see them. What about some investment? I say um, to invest. Um, so the girl at the very back. Is there any email that um, I think proposals go up forward, you'll get from someone that receive a degree of a high standard that's recognised like very well. I want to know when I walk into the employer and we say a two one in geography and they look at it and they come shut out and they look back and go shut out and do geography. How is that going to measure up? How is that recognised when they see the degree I've got has been cut from the university I went to? How can you see that it's recognised as a high standard? Because it's a degree from a strike line. But then it's worthless because the no, it's not worthless. It's not worthless. It downgrades the degree to be valid. Degree from strike line is, is not worthless at all. But it downgrades a degree if the course you've studied in is no longer available at the university. You've not seen it as a value in it. If you don't believe in it, how do you expect our pretend employers to believe in it? Because it's a degree from Strathclyde University. That doesn't matter. You don't matter. think it's worth it. It's high, but it's public as well. One person at a time, please. Um, so can we have to get what So up? just quickly, before I go on to my point, in response to that, I could do a degree in the Simpsons and it would be classed as a degree from Strathclyde. Nonsense. <laughs> the point I was going to make is you've continuously said to this girl, sorry, I don't know your name, I, um, and blame the sociology community for causing you know, the cuts and whatever else that's going on. Can I ask them why <coughs> it is, even today, I'm receiving emails from Professor Gouri and Larson, <coughs> amongst many others, who are completely opposed to what you are doing in this university. And Professor Gouri in particular, because he was involved in the setup of this faculty. And I can guarantee you, he will not sit there and say it was the community throughout Britain. It's the people sitting here today that have done it. So to pass the buck of blame 
to others that are amongst your academics peers. who are against you. And I can guarantee you that, and the letters will be flooding through your doors. I'm just interested, um, I, I know I've spoken a lot, but I'm quite frankly livid, like completely and utterly livid, um, not only at the proposal, but at the timing of it, the insensitivity of the timing of it. Um, uh, also, just to yourself, I, I just, you know, I used to respect that, that's, that's a side point, and it's, it's uh, you know, uh, emotion is not a part of this, of course, but the point I want to make, ask, uh, the question I want to ask, the point I'd like to make is, you say it's not ideological, uh, is it not economic, is that right? It's not about money? That's, that's something that's been flying about as well? It's about research, it's about academic viability. What um, is academic viability? Whether these areas are sustainable with it. Sustainable in what sense? Sustainable in the sense of significant investment. Uh, so, fin okay, so, uh, it, so could, could you please, uh, just for, in the purposes of, for the purposes of making this quick and easy, yeah. um, explain things using the, the basis terms you can. So instead of um, saying academic sustainability, say money. That's what, that's what it's about, okay? So uh, it's about money. If the university no, that's, that's has money to build, well, it's, it's essentially what you said. If the university that's has money what? to construct and, and uh, start a business school in Delhi, why is there not enough money to invest into a department which quite clearly shows the potential of being a very, very good department and in fact has given you uh, as a, a faculty, has brought to the faculty a huge amount under quite a lot of pressure, quite a lot of strain. If the university can invest in a business school in India, then, then the, the argument for not having the finances to put into the, the department are incorrect. And if, it, if it's about not having a good enough research profile, then there, there's definitely a, a, a real bitter irony in the fact that there is uh, disinvestment and not enough investment originally in staff in order to build up a research profile? I think the uh, professor, as I understand it, uh, in uh, India, which I haven't been close to, is actually self-financing activity. In other words, there isn't university investment in it, as I understand it. It's fees that the students pay. Because it's fees that the students pay, so I don't... But I, you know, I'd have to clarify that I haven't been that close. Well, we know there's myself. investment in other areas of the university. The, po the point still stands. I wasn't aware of that, so I, I, I'll no. rescind that comment. But the point still stands. There's a high level of, of investment in areas which are seen to be <coughs> profitable. The, 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 the tagline of, of the university, Strathclyde University, is a place of useful learning. Yeah. Does that mean that sociology, geography, applied music, and community education are useless? No, it doesn't. So why does it not fit into that vision of useful learning? Because these, these areas are actually, as we have identified them in, in ADG, the, these are the areas that we think, well, I think music is quite separate actually, because that's about investment in, in a new course. The course has already been withdrawn from music. It was withdrawn last year by... Was there not a new, a new course promised? Sorry? Was there not a new course promised also? No, at, at that no there, was, there, was a, there was a request from Senate that we look at whether or not a new course could be developed in that area, and that's exactly what we've done. And we can't develop it. We can't make it. We're well, looking at the three that are about so, investment. So, so I think that that deals with music is quite separate in that context. This is not about, if you like, useful learning. I mean, all areas of the faculty, in a sense, make a contribution to community. They make a contribution to society. They make a contribution to the university. One of the things that attracted me to this university was the essence of, <laughs> of useful learning. Golden, golden handshake. Okay. Um, person back in. Do you want to? Um, oh. Yeah, for me. Yeah. Sure. Uh, just wondering, last year you tried two courses, this year you're trying three courses. Is there all from Haas? Are you cutting any other courses throughout the universe or any other departments? Or is it just you uh, systematically destroying Haas? And then next year, what courses are you going to cut from Haas again? What's next? Uh, there is no what's next. Uh, I think that there are. Can you guarantee that? Yeah, I can guarantee it. There are uh, no. across yeah, the okay. universe. There are across the university other areas which are being reviewed, but those are not within my responsibility. I don't make decisions about those particular areas. But there are other areas which are being reviewed. And also in relation to the same criteria.
Okay, so we've now went over the hour mark, so yep. we're really trying to keep things concise as possible, but I'm trying to get around everyone, especially if you've not spoken before. So if you have the person in the green t-shirt, then immediately following that, and so uh, no, someone made my point. Okay, um, can we go on? To, yep. Corey, can I just ask you, just for the benefit of the people here, you're actually going to be I think PhD studentships would, would PhD if you like, would require studentships and, and so on, and those are in very short supply. Those are in really short supply, those are incredibly short supply. Sorry? You're telling us that you're not interested in research in comedy, applied music, the sociology and geography, but we're all doing undergraduate degrees just now. All different years. We all could potentially come back to Strathclyde and do PhDs in each of these areas. But how can we do that if you've got rid of those degrees? But as I said, the, the, it's an issue about potential. Uh, there are actually very few students at postgraduate level, other than postgraduate research students in sociology. Across the across the other areas, there are no there are no master students. And all four that started this year were all fully funded. Yeah. So you're saying there's no funding, but. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying in some areas. In some areas. Sorry? There's 23 PhD students in Scotland. Yeah. 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 So there's no funding for the PhD students. Yeah. That's right. That's a lot of students. That's a lot of it is a lot research students, yeah. that we are doing. Yeah. And can I say, I'm self funded. Like yeah. I came to this university. I know so many, so many so students so actually are because there aren't many studentships. I and agree. And you're closing all this area off to undergraduate students as well. That's a lot of undergraduate students who potentially can come back and do a PhD at Strathclyde, a world-renowned university. It's potential. But it's potentially a lot of money for Strathclyde. Well, Research that's, do say it's probably, not that's probably debatable. Yeah, it wouldn't be. yourself. Realistically, what can be done to get something of these proposals, some of these proposals changed? Are we, are we sitting here wasting our time or, or can something be done to say sociology and geography and, and the other, de other departments? As we said, it's, it's an open consultation, yes, and I don't think you are wasting your time. And actually, I don't think you would come here today if you thought you were wasting your time. I think you've got a genuine commitment to your subject area and you're very passionate about it and, and that's great. And in that sense, uh, I think that what you can do uh, is contest the proposals. You can look at the evidence base. You can come up with what are the potential alternatives for dealing with some of the issues, which are real issues in the context of these areas. They are slightly different in each of the areas, though. It sounds like you want us to do your job for you. No. Because you're not really contesting it with us. No, we've made the... We actually looked at putting investment in. Someone asked you about this earlier yeah. on, and I think the latest around that one, you know, said that all alternatives have been approached and yeah. discussed and we played double that. What have you actually thought about in terms of investing in these departments and also what kind of external companies, the business community, public sector bodies have been engaged with to try and get a boost into it. these departments? Because I notice that happening in other areas in the university and funding and engagement with public and private sector. That, that is something we could broach on these departments as well. I'm watching what's been done about that. I think it's a possibility, but it's also very restricted in these areas. It's very restricted in these areas. What do you mean? It's restricted in terms of the availability of funds, and if you look at the public sector institutions, already that there's restrictions on how much they're investing in universities and so on. We've, we've seen that across a number of activities within the faculty. So let, I mean, let me give you an example. Yeah. Um, the CERC, which is the Scottish Institute for Residential Childcare, which is embedded in, in the social work uh, within applied social sciences, had its budget cut by tw about 15, 20%. So I, and actually that's similar to other areas where we have engagement with the public sector because in a sense, those public expenditure restrictions are beginning to, to bite in those areas. So I think that the issue of potential there is actually quite, quite restricted. It seems ludicrous to and, me. And that wouldn't provide for the kind of investment that, that we're, we're actually talking about here. Uh, and I think to go back to investment, I mean, there is investment, it's just not necessarily 
been in the form in which, if you like, those, those areas necessarily <coughs> wanted it. I think. Um, just like with solutions to the problem, um, I think one of the key issues is the fact that jobs in sociology aren't theirs, they're two separate subjects, and the fact that there's only six classes available over both semesters for both geography and sociology students is ridiculous. I'm a geography question. I could take on the majority of sociology classes and still come out with a geography degree. They're separate subjects. So I think they shouldn't they shouldn't be together in the first place. But I think I think this is one of the issues which in the, the review group we actually considered, which is actually to go back, I don't want to use technical phrasing, it's about academic, if you like, sustainability. And that's it's not what technical phrases, I don't mean technical phrases, I mean rhetoric and jargon. What you're basically well, saying is... Well, rhetoric is quite, quite useful, it's, isn't it? It's, the Greeks were for you, yeah, of course. No, three years rhetoric ago, also has us. substance to it. Well, we understand that, we're not. Yeah. Three years ago, when you told us that putting geography and sociology together, was going to give us a stronger degree, you now say they never should have been put together. No, I'm not, I'm not saying they shouldn't have been put together. You're saying I wasn't, that there were people investigating the fact that it was problematic to put the, the yeah. boat together after we were told three years ago that it was going to enhance our learning to put the two together. Which is they were given the opportunity to enhance their learning by being put together. By putting it from 16 to 6 is increasing our opportunity no, of learning. No, the two, the two departments being merged were given the opportunity to develop synergies and enhance what they were offering, and that simply didn't happen. Because they've not got the bloody money to do it or the staff to do it. What do you want them to do? Run on air. You can email these people, Trisha, Colin Clark, at 11 o'clock at night, and you get response back at 10 past 11 that same night. They are working till midnight to be told, tapped on the shoulder, you've got probably six months of your, of your careers left, or maximum four years, and obviously they're going to go. Of course they're going to go. And then what about this guy here? And what about the rest of us here? I'm sorry, it is all rhetoric. It's all empty promises. We're, we're all trained in the social sciences, and we've been, you guys, the ideology of, of Strathclyde is to make us question the, the grey areas. Do you know what? We're not going to stop on this, you know. You've got a fight on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, come to the demo tomorrow. Um, has anyone not put up their hand, has not talked yet, would like to speak? Because um, we're now getting to... Yeah, Can I just ask a question? Earlier on, you alluded um, to the fact that some feedback had already been taken into consideration and yeah. are already sort of starting to reshape proposals. Can you specify what feedback you have listened to and you are taking into account? Well, we're taking feedback all the time as it comes so in and we're actually reviewing it's already been taken into account to reshape Well, I didn't say it's been taken into account. What I said was it was part of the deliberations of ADG. We haven't re reconfigured the proposal. Okay, what point what we're actually... There was there was certain aspects of the feedback yeah, certain things that certain things that we'd identified, which are now amplified, in terms of I think one of them, as I said already, was in terms of access, and the second one was in terms of provision, and those issues have been amplified in the responses that we've had from external parties, from student meetings that we've had, uh, and from other kind of communications. Well, can you pump out your same provision? Can you explain what you mean? I mean, provision in terms of the subject area. In Scotland. You know, in Scotland, in, in the west of Scotland or, or in Scotland. Yeah. So, so you've considered the fact that the department takes on a diverse range of students from communities that don't otherwise get into universities and that is vital to the rest of the west of the west of Scotland and then said, well, we're going to put that aside anyway? No, I didn't say we put it aside. I said those issues have been amplified. Those, those were issues which we considered, but these issues have been amplified in the consultation process. Yeah, but you can defend your position of uh, closing the Well, the department. consultation hasn't finished, so... But it's obvious to us that um, we know, <clears throat> you know that that's your position. No, that's not my position. You don't know what my position is. Uh, if you I can you, you, you don't know what my position is. So you're secretly wanting to get this department open, but you're just... No, like, no I'm saying it's a, it's, a consul it's a consultation, and we have to take those issues into account. And in the same way as the University Court and Senate, Remember, the academic development group is not the deciding body, as, as I said right at the answer. The deciding body is actually the university court and the university senate. So we will not be making the decisions. Sorry, I'm here about England. Can you tell me who is involved in the senate, what the positions are, it, and who they are? Well, I mean, it's, it's on, I mean, I can't tell you all the individuals. I, I don't know who all the individuals are. They're on the board. It's on the board. It's on the board. It's, it's, it's not okay. It's not okay. It's on the board. You can see it's listed. Well, you can, but...
It should be, yeah. And I think the same for members of the I mean, the membership is opaque. I mean, the, yeah. the draconian uh, structure of it is opaque. And the way so, that it I mean, there's students' association good. members are every yeah. Senate. I mean, Catlin and Doug yeah, Fuller yeah, there. Yeah. And they participate yeah. regularly. But is it not weighted in favour of the Board of Studies? If the Board of Studies passes anything, then it'll go to a Senate? No, it doesn't. No. 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 Board of Studies. Board of Studies doesn't have any decision making authority in relation to these issues. The only body that has decision making authority is the University Court. So it's not it's not this group, it's not the academic development group, or indeed the faculty. Again, uh, anyone that's not asked has not had the chance to spoken yet before I think we might move on to some clarifying questions I think this group would like to ask. And um, I've just made a notice we went down. Um, does anyone have any other follow questions? And pay it back. Last one. I will not see how this consultation process could be justified as a legitimization of the eventual where what might happen is the course should be cut. Do you not see how this can be this can be construed as a legitimization legitimization what you're going to do anyway? And the consultation just lets you do it. Uh, PR. No, because if you look at the consultation period for the arts and community. Uh, which was in, during April of this this year, on the proposals for those, the proposals were substantially uh, changed as a as a consequence of a two week consultation period. So, uh, in that sense, uh, it's it's not a fait accompli. That's the whole point of our consultation. Okay, very very last one. Yeah. Yeah, quite uh, you guys were already in the proposals for the consultation process here. Uh, which is against geography and sociology, but surely you should actually be writing proposals for geography and sociology to make a balanced argument in Senate and Court to make sure both sides of the argument can be heard. I think in terms of the, the proposals that are there, the proposals that, if you like, those that came out of the academic development group, uh, and that in a sense what we were looking at was, the, if you like, the strategic direction of the faculty. Okay, um, so I've picked out three questions um, from the body of group. Um, firstly, um, when the proposals, as when they started in the review process, what consideration of cognizance was given to student welfare when you began the, the consultation process at the very begin, at the beginning of the review, with knowing how long it would take and where it would eventually finalise itself and become a consultation period. What thought was given at the beginning for that? Uh, we gave every consideration to, if you like, the, the student experience in that context. What we couldn't control was, if you like, the period of review that we'd actually need. So you're saying when we started, the review we didn't know. was independent of yourself and just happened. No, I'm not saying it's independent. I said we had to we had to do justice. We had to do robust justice to that process. In other words, we didn't have a view that it would finish, if you like, at a particular point in time. We had to ensure that we reviewed these areas robustly, and that took time. And were there an estimated time for us in the beginning? The, there was a time of about four, five, six weeks, I think. And but that, was that the length of the review process? It was pretty much the, the length of the process. So at the beginning of the consultation process, you would know at an estimate that would happen at exact time? Well, we didn't, we didn't particularly know, no, because we couldn't, in a sense, we couldn't actually... You didn't think we didn't, it. No, we did think about it. What we couldn't do was actually say that at this particular point in time, because then we had to go through a process of developing those proposals, yeah. and that took time. But there was a significant risk because your estimated time doesn't make that there, there were risks in, in all of these processes, yeah. Which, um, and, we, and we thought it was important that students should hear about the, the proposal at exactly the same time as staff. So as you understand, not, yeah. actually the day before, because I emailed a member of staff and said, what the hell's going on? And that's how she found out that she was going to lose a job through a student. That by oh, itself no, is a disgrace. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not yeah. quite sure about that procedure, but if, well, I, can just, you that's what if I can just make my point. Um, the, the staff, as you understand, had to hear, had to be consulted, yep. formal process, and that had to happen immediately. And we thought it was appropriate that students should hear at, at the same time. Yep. Um, that wasn't so the what, what we it's not up a, it's not a formal requirement. No, no. What, what we brought up was not that it wasn't. That it was but that was the timing, the unfortunately. Timing yes, but what what I'm saying is this is this was the this was the timing. This was when we were doing the business of, of this particular group. Mm -hmm. It fell out at that time. But the dean has just made uh, a, a quite clear statement that 
uh, he, was, he was given a four, of four to five week. I wasn't given uh, any time. No, what I, what I said was that was our kind of initial estimate, but we could not control that because we had to so actually go through the process. You, like you, you, you were part of making that uh, decision as well then, the, on the estimate of timing. There was absolutely no strategic intention, as people have suggested, that, that, it's, that, it, that we did this during your exam time. I mean, that, I understand it was unfortunate, but it was not, it was not intentional. It actually disproportionately went against the more passionate students. The ones that are quite lackadaisical and sitting in their beds half the time weren't really that bothered. The ones that get out of bed and go to every lecture and work hard because they want a first class or a 2-1 out of this institution are the ones that took the hit in the exam. And I can tell you, I honestly believe it has affected performance yeah, in various people yeah, yeah, I have yeah. spoken to this year. I'm a first class student and I have dropped it this semester. As have I. So, you're all responsible, um, to be honest, because this still So the second question I got out of this was, um, how do we ensure the transparency of the decision making and the process from here on, um, especially to the student body? Yeah. And how is that going to be communicated and how do we know that you take on what we say? Because we'll, we take these issues back into the academic development group, it will then have to either revise those proposals in relation to the deliberations that it has. As, as I said, that it is not the decision-making body on this. It has to then go to the University Senate and it has to go to University Court. And those are the decision-making bodies and those decisions are open, transparent, public and so on. Well, the minutes of the academic development group be available to the students. I wanted to find out what responses you've come up no, because we've had to hold those com in confidential because they're, they're confidential discussions. Well, yeah. Transparent. Yeah. 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 Where are the costumers here? Where are the costumers? Yeah. 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 my career. I'm sorry, I've got to wait and left four children at home and a husband to run a house whilst I take on twenty odd thousand pounds in debt and burst a gut to put everything into this university and you're telling me that a discussion you're having about my future and my children's future are confidential? How dare you actually? That is absolutely How dare you? disgusting. Right, absolutely disgusting. I'm ashamed to call myself a staff pledge student. No, you're not. Don't let them, don't let them change the fact that we know this is a fabulous university. That is disgusting. We have no confidence in them. We'll have to just fight it. Simple. Okay. There's no way we're giving up on it. Um, I can guarantee you right now. And I will make sure that every academic that I have contact with all over Britain within sociology and geography are on your backs. And last and final point. Guys, uh, can you wait for a minute? We introduce our uh, demonstration tomorrow. <laughs> so if, uh, um, um, if uh, we're all having a demonstration tomorrow, and it'd be nice if we could discuss it without the dean of the faculty being there. And yeah. Stuff, so. yeah. You're going to say confidential. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so I think that will wrap us up. If there's any very last points, um, I'll take them there. But other than that, okay. Thank you for attending and thank you for the panel for giving us. Yeah, well, it's just because it's just because I can't see that. It's just only a problem.